We're going to look at the book of Daniel tonight. I was going to, you probably should have, dealt with the spiritual gifts. I don't want us to forget the importance of the series that we've just come through and the need that we have to implement that into our ministry. But we will, uh, we will deal with that frequently and put those things into practice. Daniel chapter 10 tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your marvelous grace that's enriched in our hearts and our lives. Our perspective is that you are a sovereign God, one to be worshipped, one to be glorified, one to give our life to. That's been our belief for some time. Now as we come to the book of Daniel chapter 10, may it enrich our hearts tonight that we might have a better understanding of the, the content that's in the book that we may be more vigilant in our service for you. Thank you for your loves you've given us and we'll give you thanks. Amen. Jimmy and uh, Dorothy, now who, who was it telling me that Lois didn't feel like, didn't want to leave Jimmy? Yeah, Serena called. Serena called, so he is really not doing very well, from what I understand. Daniel chapter 10 is interesting. In the occult, the paranormal phenomena is on the rise today and has been for the last 20 years. The movie industry has certainly capitalized on this heightened curiosity. Not to mention the numerous television programs, newspapers, magazine articles, game manufacturing, book publishers, and movies that have hyped these topics as well. Unfortunately, as we know, the fragments of truth that are amidst this sensational stories and it's unreal. Someone said you really believe there's ghosts. There are no ghosts, folks. The only ghost there is would be demon spirits, if there is any such thing as that. For the Lord's Messengers, angels. Uh, for, yeah. Consequently, many people have a distorted understanding about satanic realm, the teaching of Scripture on this subject stands obviously in stark contrast to the misfortune that is commonly put out there and consumed some of the biblical data about demons perhaps is found in Daniel chapter 10. Among other things, this passage exposes the unseen war being waged against God's people in the demonic forces. And frankly and thankfully, this chapter makes it clear that those who fight on the Lord's side have the power they need to overcome the adversities and the adversaries. So let's take an opportunity to gain some biblical perspective on the invisible war being fought between heaven and earth. Now notice, first of all, the boundary of the natural world. It is natural 
It is the nature of man that he is bound by time and nature. There is no air conditioning. It's broken. Well, it's not. It does. I don't think it works, do you? I don't think it's on yet, does it? Mm -hmm. It's not on. Yes. We have, we have captivated, we are captivated by the natural world. <clears throat> we have no capacity to get out of this natural state that we are in. We just cannot get out of it. <clears throat> we can't leave our natural state. I don't, you know, we're locked in. I'm leaving Ohio. I'm sorry. Uh, she's I'm leaving, leaving Ohio. She's leaving Ohio. I can leave my natural state. In spite of those who claim that they have outer body experiences, there really isn't one. We cannot get outside of ourselves yet. If we are to get into the supernatural, it must come to us. Because if we can't get to it, God must invade time and space because we can't leave it. And that is what happens in these verses. Heaven comes to earth. In a glorious vision, Daniel is visited by some beings that give him the fourth and his last of his marvelous visions. And Daniel gives us four prophetic visions. This is his last. And we've, we've, and he goes through chapters 10, 11, and 12. And chapter 10 introduces us to the vision. And chapter 11 gives us the prophecy. And chapter 12 gives us the end of it. Now, we come to the end, we, we come to the end of the things to come. And this prophecy covers a, the period of chapter 8 from, ten, from Daniel's time to the great tribulation to the return of Christ it gives greater detail of the tribulation and the next five messages will give detail of the coming events of Israel the Middle East and the future chapter 9 is the scene in the first year of Cyrus that was the year Cyrus gave the word to go back to Jerusalem. In chapter 10, it's the third, third year of Cyrus, and the people have not moved. They like it in Babylon. They like it in Babylon. They had been paganized. They were absorbed in the activities they were in. Some people just don't want to leave earth because it had to leave the moose and the goose and the lodge and the masons and, and the lions and uh, the polite classes. They're not ready to go yet. <coughs> they got one more trip to Florida. To, I mean, sorry. Yeah. To go. Sorry. Well, you know what? If if that's the last trip, or if it don't happen, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, greatest, the greatest majority of the priests and the chiefs of the people in that day in Babylon preferred they built their houses and the gardens which they had planted in Babylon. They would rather not go back to Israel. They were involved in the land to carry about the promised land. They were too involved in the land to carry about rebuilding Jerusalem. And they were too involved of, to rebuild the temple. That's why they were in Babylon in the first place. Because they wouldn't do a good job of it. Ezra chapter 1, the first 11 verses tell us how many went back to Jerusalem. 42,500, look at your eyes, 42,500 42, went back. There, that was not even the tenth. That was only a drop in a bucket. I'm just thinking they don't have any movie bands or anything. They just had to walk. Ain't interesting. 
No wonder they didn't want to go back. Those that did went back was led by whom? Zerubbabel. He was in the land of David, the seed of the king, but he couldn't set to kingship. So he had a high priest by the name of Joseph who was their spiritual leader. When they got back, it took them seven months to clear off the rubble of the temple site. Nothing to say about the city that we discussed some time ago, how bad they destroyed the city. But what we saw a movie the other week about the destruction of Jerusalem, oh my goodness, I don't know how they depicted that, but they just massacred the city. They just destroyed the city. And now Israel's got, not, they have to go back. It, no, it was a movie about those days, how they destroyed, how they destroyed the city. It's been destroyed many, many times. And so they started to rebuild, and they were opposed, and they were pushed, mocked, scorned, hated, until finally they decided just to stop altogether. Well, Daniel had wanted the whole nation to go back to Jerusalem the whole nation to go back and rebuild the temple in the city and the wall and reconstruct the nation and worship and everything would be like it was before. They left, but it just wasn't so. So a small number went back and they couldn't pull it off. They couldn't establish the nation, nor the monarchy, nor rebuild the city, nor even get the sanctuary going. In that third year, another thing happened. Daniel retired. And he was one of the presidents of the total empire. There were three presidents, and he was one of the three presidents of the entire empire. He was 85 years old. So, why didn't Daniel go back? He was lazy. Some say because he was lazy. I mean, because he was old. Really, though he was old, that's not the reason he didn't go back. He was so disappointed. He saw himself as having the responsibility to motivate the remaining Jews to go back. 